Continuing back where we left off, so we implemented this prov active alternative of. So the next one we're going to try to implement is access tuple, which is the one that we weren't really familiar with before, but obviously we realized it's possible and just as easy as active alternative of. So refresh. All it is is it's an argument provider generator called access tuple. It takes a tuple like, in this case tup, and a runtime index, in this case which, and it returns an argument provider of the corresponding tuple element. So what are the building blocks that we might need for this? So first of all, we need a way to access a tuple like using a compile time index. We need a way to transform an argument from a runtime value to a compile time index. And we need a way to represent an argument provider that has the composition of the transformation of the actual access. So this should look really, really similar to all the requirements, requirements that we needed for active alternative of. So let's just try to Frankenstein it. We'll take the active alternative of and just try to, you know, fiddle with the bits to get it to correspond to the implementation of access tuple. So this is the converted form. And I'll just go through a couple of the changes. Obviously, the first thing we change is we're no longer dealing with variants. We're dealing with tuples. If we had constrained this, we would obviously ch uh, change the constraint from being constrained for variant to being constrained for tuples. Uh, we added an extra size uh, index parameter. And just like we had this thing called variant index, uh, the library provides something called tuple index, which does exactly the same thing, except instead of taking a variant, it takes a tuple, and you give it a runtime value, and it will convert it to the std integral constant that corresponds. And it's in the range zero to the tuple size. The only thing, other thing that's changed in this is we no longer have to use some kind of associated function to pull out some kind of index, because we get it from the parameter, so we just pass in index directly. So that's just passing it along from there. And just as this worked, just as this worked before for active alternative of, because all we're doing is we're lifting the call, we're not actually executing anything here. So all this does is it creates a description of the actual operation that we will eventually perform. So examining what does prob uh, access tuple actually do in the internals when it actually goes through its provision operation, we described this a little bit. It's effectively just a switch statement, just like with the uh, active alternative of. And just like with the switch statement, when the returns don't match, then you have some kind of a failure. So the return types must be the same. What do you do? How do you handle errors when you get an outer range index? Keep that in mind. So the question was, what do you do when you get an outer range index? So for now, with this implementation, this would be undefined behavior. But there is a solution to that. I mean, you could also obviously just write an if check. There is an alternative solution, though. Okay. Yep. Uh, so the return types must be the same. But as we talked about earlier, that's not actually true. And in a couple of slides, I'll go into why that's not true and how you can take advantage of the fact that even if these return different values, you can use this functionality, and you'll be able to actually execute the function. So. Before we go there, though, some additional features of Access Tuple that we didn't implement in the previous slide, but that are present in the library. Uh, are, first of all, it deals with the actual natural index type of the tuple of the, the tuple size. For std tuple, the natural index type is std, is std size t. But for the tuple traits, you're able to specialize it for your specific tuple type if you're over, overriding it. So a minor detail, but it is one thing that's a little bit different. Uh, another thing is, the actual access tuple is overloaded in such a way that it works with passing a std integral constant directly. And the idea here is that if you pass in the integral constant directly, rather than passing in a runtime value, it does exactly the same thing, except it avoids any branching or dispatching. And the idea of this is that you can basically compose your argument providers and change at certain points during the composition, which things are runtime and which things are compile time values, and it will naturally result in the form that has the least amount of branches. And yeah, obviously, as I mentioned, it's also properly constrained for valid tuples and indices. And 
as Jackie was questioning, there is a customizable fallback for when the index is out of range. And it's const expert. And going back to this slide, this wasn't const expert, or this wasn't const expert basically only because we didn't write const expert here. <laughs> and we just, we could have. But everything that it depends on is currently const expert, and the entire library is const expert. So you can do all of this completely at compile time. Okay, so what have we learned from this example? Well, prov access tuple is not magic. Uh, it's really easy to convert from the runtime world to the compile time world when you have these kinds of tools. And you may have already encountered situations where this would be useful, but because you're not thinking in this mindset, you just assume it's, you know, it's not really possible or you know maybe how to do it, but it would be too complicated, so you just avoid it. But the idea is once you have these kinds of facilities just you know, right at your grasp, it may open the doors to new things. So we implemented access tuple. Most people here, has, has anybody not seen how to implement unpack? Like an actual, uh, like a std, I should say a std apply. Has anybody seen how to implement std apply? Well, we're gonna do it in a little different way from how it's normally implemented. So. Description of problem pack, again, this corresponds to std apply. And what it is, it's an argument provider generator called unpack. It takes a tuple like and it returns an argument provider that represents each element as a separate argument. So all we're doing is we're unpacking our tuple. So example of that, once again, you have a tuple of A, B, and C. And we're gonna unpack it, passing it to output. Output is one of these magic functions that we've described before that uses CRTP, which is why we can just use this very convenient syntax. What building blocks might we need to do prob unpack? And keep in mind, this is the lazy prob unpack that's not greedily evaluating things. Well, we need a way to access the tuple like using a compile time index. We already know how to do this because we had to do that for the access tuple example. We need to a way to generate all of the valid indices of a tuple in the form of separate arguments. Seems to be cut off. Uh, so we don't. We haven't seen exactly how to do this. Does anybody know a standard library facility that does something sort of like this? Index, index, index sequence, yeah. So traditionally when you're implementing apply, you generate, you use std uh, make index sequence and you give it the length of the sequence and it generates uh, uh, effectively an integer sequence with all compile time constants zero up to the, uh, up to the end of your tuple if you happen, happen to pass in the tuple size as the argument. So it turns out we actually have a corresponding version of this in, uh, in this library, except instead of generating an index sequence, we can just generate all of the arguments directly and pass them as the integral constants. So we can elim eliminate a little bit of the, uh, the indirection or of the, the complexity asymmetry. And we finally need a way to compose the transformation and the actual access. So this is the, the version of effectively make index sequence or it fulfills the role that we used for, for uh, index sequence if you were to implement std apply. Uh, it's called tuple indices and it takes as an explicit template argument a tuple like. And given the tuple like passes an explicit template argument, it provides all valid tuple indices in order as std integral constant. So an example of this, if you have struct ABC and your tuple is equal to the tuple type std tuple ABC, if you were to call foo, foo again is a magic function, and you pass in prov tuple indices of tup, it will call foo with, you know, std integral constant zero, one, and two, because the size of the tuple is three. Now that we have that, uh, can anybody think of a way to implement this in one line? One single statement? Say that? Composing tuple indices with access tuple. Right on. So, Yep, you just call prob transform. All of the tuple indices being generated, we bind in the tuple. Here it's a const tuple just because I was lazy and didn't want to do forwarding on this slide. And all we do is we call access tuple with i. And i here, keep in mind, is a std integral constant. And access tuple is overloaded to work for integral constants. Everything works out. 
And that's that. We have a one-liner uh, unpack that we can now use with call, and it can appear anywhere in the argument list. So there is another way. I, I've, I've shown how to create argument providers by way of composition, uh, and that's usually the easiest way to do things. But you can also manually go and create an argument provider. The way that you manually go and create an argument provider is you specialize your traits. Uh, I showed you which associated function uh, argument provider had, and it only has one. It's called the provide function. Unfortunately, if you want to do this, it's much more complicated than just using composition, but you do get uh, better compile times. So generally, uh, what the internals of the library does is anywhere it would be beneficial to manually create uh, an, argu an argument provider specialization, it does so instead of performing it via uh, composition. And I don't have any examples of actually specializing. Uh, that How you do the, the mechanics of that specific form of specialization is in flux, and I don't want to commit to anything by putting it in a talk. So. so let's go back and look at one of our motivating cases and see if what we've learned so far has made our lives easier for the problems that we had at the beginning. So if you remember way back at the beginning, we said, OK, we wanted to serialize a variant. Very easy. Just write a generic serialize function for std variant. Serialize the index follow the active alternative. So serialize the index, visit the, uh, the active element of the variant. Here we're using our active alternative of and the lambda to serialize. Now we get to what was the hard part before. Write a generic deserialization function for std variant. Now, without this library, we basically had no way to do it. I mean, we have ideas and we have convoluted ways that would require like manually making switches or doing you know, various things. But we now have the tools to do this in one line right here. Does anybody have an idea of how it can be done? And this line may involve a lambda, so. <laughs> so Vittorio's statement is we need to take the index and, and, and match it up to a type, you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Do we have a way to transform the variant to tuple? What, uh, make, make a tuple index <laughs> at the right time. So we have a way of getting a, a variant index already. So okay. we did have the variant index function. So we don't have to convert to the tuple okay. to use tuple index. Good. So knowing that we have variant index. Well, can't you just do deserialize archive, um, then like value of get app active alternative of the variant? So we can't do that because right now the variant is not in the state that we need it. What we have to do is we have to figure out what state corresponds to this deserialized index. Oh, so get active alternative doesn't take the existing index. No, get active alternative takes a, an existing variant and it will access the currently active element. What we have to do oh, okay. here, what we have to do here is somehow set set the active element so that way we can deserialize into it. Uh, Miha? Yeah, so so I would have the idea of like making a and of course you would. <laughs> so Mihao has the idea of making a tuple of lambdas. And indexing that by i. And indexing that by i. There is a much simpler solution than this. <laughs> but that's an interesting idea. No, no, no. But we could do this, that with this and with the active tuple. OK, so describe your solution again when, when we're really slowly so I make sure I understand it. First argument would be a lambda that takes like takes a lambda and calls it. The second argument would be uh, access tuple or make tuple or expand the pack of lambdas. Uh, that pack of, uh, I lost you. I'm going to assume that maybe you are correct, <laughs> but I guarantee you that what I have behind this slide is simpler than that. <laughs> that <works>. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, 
So I, I'll, I can give a hint. We don't have to do anything with the tuple here. Runtime match from yeah, right now we'll. And then you can uh, index into the t dot 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 And that's just the type. But I don't know how to do index into that pass without the tuple. Especially if you print the type and not the index. That might be a different direction. Sometimes. I'm going to try to give a hint here. <laughs> so, uh, something I haven't talked about, how, and it might be because people aren't that familiar with variant. When you are creating, when you are putting the variant into a specific state, what are the various ways that you can do that? Assignment, construction, uh, and place. Mm -hmm. Assignment, construction, and in place. Is there one or multiple of these that might be convenient given that we currently have an index? Can you default construct based off the index? Uh, we haven't shown a way to convert from the index to the type yet. If you could come up with a way on the spot, I mean, it's definitely feasible, but there's a way, to give a hint, there's a way that we do not have to index into the type sequence. So, correct. So, so right. Exactly. So as Vittorio, Vittorio stated, M place, there's an, a version of M place that takes a compile that takes a compile time index value. So <laughs> Okay. So Vittorio basically already described exactly what to do. And that is we need to make something like a lambda. Uh, and we convert this runtime integer to the compile time integer and we call M place with this now converted to compile time constant. So the way this looks is we're going to call, and I didn't feel like inlining the lambda here, so I named it, call some deserialization function, forwarding along the archive and the, and converting the variant index. And then the implementation of deserialize impl is very simple, and it could have been inlined. It's just a lambda that takes, and we're, again, we're forwarding these along, archive, <laughs> variant, and index. Now the thing to keep in mind here is that index, even though I list it as auto, is a std integral constant, so it is a true compile time constant. The reason why we could pass it to in place here is because there is a const x for conversion. And the return type of in place is a reference to the element. And so we can just deserialize directly into it. Yeah, so that's so the comment was can you also just capture the archive here? and v here, not pass them along here, and have this be a unary function? Is that effectively what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, so you can do that as well. The only reason I did it this way is just because it's the spirit of the talk, forwarding things along. Yep. But, so that's that. And now, all of a sudden, this thing that was so incredibly complicated that we just, you know, we just gave up, we can do in just one line. And now, is there a safety concern here? Well, I need to be in range. Right. Otherwise, it's UB. Yep. So I need to be in range, otherwise, it's UB. This is exactly what uh, Jackie was saying earlier. Because in the earlier example, we were taking user input i to access a tuple. And obviously, that's very, very unsafe. <laughs> Anybody could just put anything, and you'll just overflow. Here, it's even more obvious because we're like deserializing. Who knows where this data is coming from? So that's the problem right there. Uh, you could do it with an if statement and just check before you make the call that everything's in range. Alternatively, two variant index and also all of the um, argument providers you've seen that do these runtime conversions have an optional second parameter that describes what to do in failure. So if it's out of range, there's this prov default uh, type, or I, I should say object, and it has various member objects and member functions that control what to do in the failing case. In this case, what we're saying is, if it's out of range, we're going to throw some exception. And this could be any user-defined exception. So when it does the visit, 
the, you know, the equivalent of the visit. If it's out of range, we'll get a throw, uh, an exception thrown. Alternatively, you don't have to throw an exception. You don't have to fail even. You can also provide a, fallback, a set of fallback arguments. So if you just call prov default and you pass in an argument provider, you can give it any arguments you choose. So if you wanted to detect, detect failure, you can do it inside of your deserialize impl function here. If you provided a default that was unambiguous with respect to you know, std integral constants. So you wouldn't want to put like std integral constant zero here. You'd probably put some you know, dummy flag type and then you could handle that failure from inside of whatever lambda you pass. And there are various other ways of specifying defaults that I don't go into detail here. And where there's default, there's also case. So the reason why that's called default is underlying all of this is a prov switch statement. Or I shouldn't say all of this, but some of the argument providers we've seen or used are backed by a, a prov switch. And what prov switch is, is it's effectively a, an EDSL for representing switch statements. Uh, and so when you write prov switch, you give it a value to expand and a set of cases. So this here is a case that corresponds to the option type that's up here that we're passing in as the condition to our switch. And it specifies that in, in the case that my option is option A value, this provider is going to result in an argument foo. In the case B, it's going to result in the argument bar. And in the default case that we don't handle, which happens in, in this particular example to only be C, then we're going to provide nothing. Uh, in addition to all of these different, uh, these different types of cases in default, there are also prov case and a variadic set of arguments. And so if you want to handle A and B, in the same way, you can write case option A, comma, option B. And this is very similar to a fallback, or a, I mean a fall through. And so in both cases, it would return this argument. In addition to that, you can write prov case option colon colon A dot to constant, and it will convert that case to a std integral constant as the provider. And that also works with the variadic case. So you have various ways of, of forming switch statements that correspond directly to a switch statement that is actually used in the back end. And the way this works is uh, I generate through preprocessor metaprogramming uh, a switch statement up to a finite limit, I think currently up to 20. And once you go beyond that, it just does uh, a chain of, of switch statements. So if you have like, 40 cases, it would only use two statements, and it just branches off in the default. So everything is fully just backed by a, like an actual switch when this actually goes under argument provision. So the, the reason you'd want to use something like this is there's this other argument writer I mentioned called value and set. And it's basically just like the value and range that we saw before, where you give a, a beginning and an end. And this one, you just give a set of values that can be dis, you know completely like disparate. They don't have to be uh, uh, contiguous in, in any sense. Uh, one example where you might want to use this is imagine you have a variant with a very large number of alternatives. And in your application, you happen to know that it's in a finite subset of those alternative cases. You can use something like value and set to set up that explicit set of possible alternatives. And then you can do a visit on that and the only cases that you have to handle are the explicit cases that you know it will be in. And this can also reduce um, compile the amount of comp uh, compile time instantiations because you don't have to instantiate all of, the, all of those other cases that you know can never be hit. You don't have to create fallback cases for all of those things. And where this might come up, for instance, is if you are implementing a state machine and you happen to know that for certain event types or things like that, it only corresponds to currently active to a certain set of states in which case you can do things like implement a visit only over those specific states, assuming you trust your input. So it ends up being a, a pretty interesting and powerful feature. I mostly added it just as an experiment, but it's, it has its uses. Uh, and as I mentioned before, any, you can use that default with any of these uh, uh, argument providers. Really, it's any of the ones that return values we, or that, that uh, convert values to uh, compile time constants. 
Uh, I've only shown a few of them here. So now that we've got all of like, the low-level details, we know how to compose things, we know how to do a whole bunch of stuff, let's look at a more uh, practical case. And it's going to be collision detection. So imagine you have an application that has a bunch of primitive types. We'll say, for now, just three, because it's easy. You have a triangle, you have a circle, you have a rectangle. And these contain things like you know, their, their vertex offset, offsets, radius, orientation, whatever. You have an overload set, completely compile time, of checks for if two of the objects are in collision. So obviously, if you're comparing if a triangle and a triangle are in collision, it has to be a completely different function than if you're comparing that a triangle and a circle are in collision. So these are an overload set rather than like a, something like a single uh, function call that's a template. You'd have to specialize anyway. So we have this overload set. Now, for some of our shapes, we don't know which one we'll have until runtime. So we can't just call in collision. So how might we represent this sort of union of triangle, circle, rectangle? And the obvious way is to make a variant of a triangle, a circle, and a rectangle. <coughs> and now, we're just going to do a visit. We've already seen this. We'll make a, a function object. Here, uh, I'm not inheriting from CRTP, but I'm using it as though I did, just because I ran out of space in the slide. Uh, but it's very trivial. We have our collision function. And now we're able to call it whether one's a variant and one's not a variant, or they're both variants, or neither of them are variants. Everything works. However, what if we'd like more rich information from our collision function? For instance, in the triangle triangle collision, maybe we want to get the, uh, the, bound, the, the volume that overlaps, some kind of description there. And similarly, for all of the other different types of collision, what we end up getting, we started with this, we end up getting a bunch of functions like this, but they all have different return types. The thing is, we know that they're all convertible to bool. So at the very least, We'd like to have some way of just saying, hey, do this conversion. That obviously won't work immediately. Well, not obviously, but as I said, the return times have to be the same by default. Won't work immediately, because all possible overloads must have the same return type. But there is a solution. And the solution is you can specify a strategy for reducing your return types to a single return type, and you can convert your values to a value of that converted type. And the way that you do this is through a mechanism called a return value reducer. And all that a return value reducer is, is it's a function that takes in a compile time type list. So this is just basically a type list, like a traditional C++ MPL kind of style type list. Uh, a, fu a function to execute, which corresponds to the entire call expression after all arguments are bound together and compacted into a single function object, and then a trailing set of types. So uh, the way you can think about this is there are n different overloads. This will be you know, the, the leading set of, n, of the return types of the first you know, k overloads. This is the actual function that's being called at runtime, and these are the trailing ones. So the order matters here, but combined, all of the types represented here, the return type of this function, and all of the return types here represent all of the possible return types of all possible overload paths. So when you implement your reduce function, all you have to do is make it such that regardless of what these sets are, the return type is always the same, and you provide some kind of conversion routine internal to the reduce function that brings them all to the same value. And once you do that, you're able to come up with a reduction that works with um, function types have varying return types. So usually you don't want to actually do this. I'm just showing the internals. I actually provide a suite of ones that you will probably want to use in practice. So before we do that, I'll show you how you actually use a return value reducer. As we've seen before, you just when you normally use call, you just use call, pass in a function object, and then an argument provider. If you want to specify a reducer, you simply use the bracket operator after the call. And whatever you put here obviously has to be a model of the return value reducer concept that I specified before. 
this is the only return type or value reducer that we've seen before, which is called same type or fail. And it does exactly what it sounds like. If all of the return types are not exactly the same, then substitution will fail. And so if you do not put brackets here, it's exactly the same thing as doing this. So we've seen that one, which is the default uh, uh, return, or return value reducer. One that we might want is this, reducer2. And what this does is it does implicit conversions, void conversions, and bool conversions. So you could also use a shorthand call underscore, pass in an explicit template argument t, and it will also do these things. So if we go back to our earlier example, oh, apparently don't have a good example here. Hold on. Back here, we did have an explicit conversion to bool. Had we put open square bracket here to bool, close square bracket, this would now be a well-formed expression, and it would implicitly do the conversion. Was anybody lost by that? Because I think that was a complicated part of this talk. But oh, so void conversions. So in other words, if you just write call t and void, all that just means is just discard whatever the return whatever the return value would have been. So it's the same. It's the same thing that std function does. You can bind functions that. You know, have return values to a some to a std function that returns void. Then it's not. Yeah, yeah, yep. What happens when it fails? When what fails? So it's same type or fail. What, what is fail? Uh, it's substitution failure. So uh, in other words, the same thing as like a Sphene failure or a concept uh, requirement failure, anything like that. The yeah. So, so the question was, what, what do I mean by failure? And, and yeah, the answer is just substitution failure. So that's two. In addition to two, we also have a more explicit transform. This one is stateful. So if you don't have some kind of an implicit conversion operator to convert to, but you do have some known conversion. So for instance, instead of operator bool, we had something like in collision as a member function, you can just use a reducer that is transform and specify uh, the exact call to uh, you know, in collision. And then it will forward back as, as your bool or whatever the conversion returns. One of the more interesting ones <laughs> that, everybody, that everybody asks for, <laughs> this came maybe. So this one came as a request by Eric Niebler when I first started pursuing this project, is two variant. <laughs> if you know that all of the return paths are, are, are different things or potentially different things, you can always return it, just return it in a variant. Um, and that works. I don't know if I have an example of us using it. But. OK, yeah, I do. Whoop. Does it automatically know what the types are? Yep. So the way it knows what, the re what all the return types are is as I showed earlier, like any time you do a visit with like the provide when you call branch or when you call receive, I shouldn't say you when the implementation does, it's always communicating the return types of every single possible path. So at any given stage of this whole process, all branch paths are known. So it's able to figure out the exact order in the exact cases. And so this even works if you have multiple things returning like int. This will work, and they will be separate int entries in the variant. I do provide, I, I'm not sure if I have it on this slide, but we'll see next. There is a way to actually even collapse them down if you have duplicates and you want to deduplicate. This is what the next question. So the first question I have is, can you change your use? Can you change reducers, I guess? Can you chain reducers? Can you give uh, a concrete example? Uh, A variant of all the results of the conversion function. Or the collision function in your example in the previous slide. Yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. Like of the, uh, yeah, so in other words, you have one of them, and you want to take the result, and then you want to reduce it even further. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't think of an obvious way to do it. I bet there probably is an obvious way that I just can't 
I'm, I'm not thinking of right now, but it should be easy to implement if there's not already just some clever way to do it already, but I can't think offhand. Well, what if the, the amount of types ended up being one? Would you still have that overhead, it, runtime overhead of a variant? Well, it would still be a variant. You're, oh. I was just thinking you could probably do it with list um, in queues and just know the provider for it. Uh, probably, yeah. But uh, so, so providers aren't expanded in the angle bracket or in the square brackets, if, if that's what you're saying to do the. But I, it could, they could be. <laughs> um, but interesting. So, um, uh, so in, when it gets down to the variant one case, you were saying, do you still get the overhead of the. So, if you use two variant, it will always give you a variant. And the idea is you want to avoid this kind of special case for the for the one-th case, the zeroth case, because in all the other end cases, you have to access, if you're accessing it, you have to access with variant access. So uh, if you want it to be something different for the terminating case, just don't use um, two variant. And here's just an example of that from earlier. You can call in collision, and you check. Reducer, two variant. You're giving it this time a. Uh, Square, the type is known at compile time. This one, the type is known only at runtime, but you know that it's coming from the variant. Internally, it calculates all of the possible, um, all of the possible return types. In this case, it would be the return type of collision between square and triangle, square and circle, square and shape. And it will make a, a variant of all of, those, uh, of all of those options, so there's only three. So it would be a variant of size three, and the return types would be all of those you know, all the corresponding uh, return types that I showed earlier. And so you, pr you, by doing this, you're able to preserve all of the information that you wanted to preserve from the collision check. So if each one of those return types had, you know, collision bodies, like, or, you know, the intersections and descriptions there, none of that information is lost. And then if you wanted to uh, access it again, you can just, uh, you can visit the variant or, you know, chain it along with another one of these things. So, okay, so I do have a, 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 an, el an element for this. So this name will probably change. Uh, so it's, this one's called two heterogeneous variant. And what this does is if there are any duplicated types, it will collapse them all down. So I, I had that, but I don't like using unique because of like unique pointer things and I don't know, but I, I, I probably should just have it be unique variant. But. And because when you say unique variant, it sounds like the variant itself is unique. You're not the first person to suggest that. <laughs> uh, that name will change. I actually changed that name a few times. So correct variant. <laughs> That's what Peter Dimov would say. Is, is the correct variant. I actually, I, I actually disagree. I, th I do think variants with duplicated types do uh, do make sense. Do make sense in certain con in certain contexts. I think the, the contexts where you want unique ones are, or at least a subset of them, are cases where you want your variant to represent all models of a given concept and you're just basically using it as an implementation of something like type erasure. But there are other cases where you're using variants that have a totally different meaning, such as if you're implementing in range V3 a join of, of various ranges your iterator type needs to be a variant of the iterator types. And in this case, you may have a very, uh, let's say you join a deck with a vector, the iterator types are different, and you get a variant of two elements. If you join a vector with a vector, the iterator types are the same, and there is value in having a variant of these two things, even though the two types are the same. They have different indices, and they have different semantics, and they mean different things when you're, when you're expanding out that iterator and iterating over your entire sequence. So I do think that, that, like, I have personal criticisms of std variant. I think it is a good variant, uh, but this is not one of the things that I sort of don't like about it. I think that, I think it is the right choice to support um, duplicated types and variants. But, but uh, I don't know whether it should be the shorter name. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if it should be the shorter name either. No, definitely not, because if you think variant, if you think enums as variants of void. If, if it would be possible. The enum is just a variant of different voids. It's just the index different describes the, the value of the enum. Then in the second case, all our enums would just shrink to one value. You could not, you couldn't make an ambiguation. Mm -hmm. So mathematically, the, the 
two the mathematically the variant is the correct one. Okay. Yeah. And I just want to confirm that that was the motivation of the standardization committee for having the right way. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I I totally agree with that. <laughs> and 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 coming from the boost background, I I was converted from that because I used to think and and it's because it's for the very reason that I used to only use variants or for these types of situations where I was like type erasing things. This is only a subset of your situations and it's not you know it's it falls out of that, but the, but, the, but the true variant really should be able to have duplicated types. So I, I think I agree that this, yeah, this probably should be the default. Um, there is another one that I haven't yet created that I also think would be useful. Uh, and I feel like describing it now because uh, I, think, I think it's useful, <laughs> is if all of your return values are variants themselves, you might want to combine all of those variants. So that is distinct from these. So with these, you're getting a bunch of non-variants and you're forming a variant. The other alternative is you get a bunch of variants and you want to keep them as one variant rather than having a variant of variants. And if you do that, you can imagine you'd still have two flavors. You'd have this version and that version. That's something I haven't implemented. It would be pretty easy to implement. And you could imagine very easily um, uses for this. Uh, a quick example of that would be if in your collision function, as I was saying, you can you can uh, encapsulate in your return type um, the overlapping uh, segments, and for various uh, combinations, some of the some of the segments, you know, if you combine a circle and a circle, the collision might be a point. If you combine two triangles, you might get a line segment. But also, if you combine two rectangles, you get a line segment. If you were representing your your uh, your collisions as variants of the different kinds, and each one was a variant of those things, when you did the overall reduction, you'd probably want to collapse those all down. If the only thing that you actually cared about was specifically that, and not, you know, the source of the actual uh, objects, so there's there's lots of of places to go with this. Um, there's one more, and unfortunately, I didn't. I ended up removing the example for where this is used, but I will describe it. Uh, so, reducer, provide result to, and you give it an argument receiver. And we haven't actually seen any implementations of argument receiver, which is why I removed the slide. <laughs> but basically, this reducer is how lift call is implemented. So lift call is actually a one-line statement. It's just a one-line uh, return of an invocation of the call algorithm and using this as a, um, as a, uh, a reducer. So, unless I'm missing something, especially for the collision of Kafka, uh -huh. wouldn't it be better to let the reason Kafka run that and just provide a continuation that accepts all possible types that can be returned by the collision function? And then it just basically builds a chain. Yes. And, you and so you can, yes. So, and you can actually do that with, you effectively get that when you do, uh, when you form larger expressions with like lift call or with bind. Uh, so it's just a choice. If you want to, if, so if you want it to be like that, don't use a reduction. But if you do want it to be like that, so another way of thinking about this: when you use call, it's almost like having a future, doing a bunch of thens, and then calling dot get. So once you exit the call, it's like you did a dot get. But really, what you want to do to be optimal is stay inside all of those expressions. You know, accumulating all of your effectively all your like continuations as long as you can, and then eventually you escape out with what with this. What you're saying is, if you need to chain calls, you need to do it inside the same call. There is no way of saying call then call. Well, you can save your call. I mean, you, your call isn't actually executed. So, you, so, you, so you form a prov expression, and you, you you could save it, you know, as a local variable in your stack, and then you can do a lift call on that. So I mean, you can. It's not like it has to be all in one big thing. It's just yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of similar to if you were yeah if you were chaining continuations on like a future with then or something along those lines. Um, there's something else I wanted to say on this topic. Oh, so uh, one of my active areas of research on this that I did not finish in time for the conference is, in the spirit of talking about continuations, I was working on a version of call that's not call, 
but that is called async call. And what it supports is a provider that is when ready. So you form a function call expression. Have any number of arguments you want. And then if you have a future for one of your arguments, you write when ready and you pass in your future. It implicitly forms a continuation. Fortunately, I did not finish that in time for the talk. But that's the general direction I want to go is, is once you have a facility like that, you effectively have a way of forming and chaining continuations in a way that looks like normal function calls. But another part is, could you take your provider and have it actually give the pack, essentially a pack of arguments? Uh -huh. You could serialize that entire pack of arguments, deep freeze it, or transfer it to another machine for it to invoke, uh, to be called on. What you're talking about, like an art? Like I'm just wondering if you could just sort of like you can freeze dry arguments, set them all to the side, call them at a later point. I mean, presuming there's a lot of other state that you have to also remember. But I'm not, I'm not sure I'm following where you're saying that you're doing this operation, like inside of a. So if you, I'm saying if you had these arguments, you it, essentially you provide. You create they've them. okay. So so you have them. So you have a, a provision expression. So like a yes. okay. <coughs> So at this point, though, the, yeah, you don't actually have the arguments at this point. You just basically have a description of a computation. So the only time you have the actual arguments is when it's actually fully expanded. Until then, it's just a description of things. So you can't, uh, you can't really do anything. It's kind of like a future without a get. <laughs> I'm sure there are many directions. I am not an expert on coroutines. I am not an expert on, I'm, I'm really not a concurrency expert. So like I haven't done. Um, well, like, coroutines are pretty much syntactic sugar. For futures and then's and then, and, and, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, maybe you could probe, like make the syntax nicer by using a way to something like that. Just it's very, yeah, it's very possible, yeah. Uh, but ultimately, like the whole the whole point of this library isn't really for people to use it. <laughs> the whole point of this library is sort of a, it's sort of more of a research project to inform me on how to instead of doing this as a library, understand what the requirements are to get us to a place where we can implement this more as a language feature. So going back to like my beginning slides, I was showing comparisons with Python and C++. And the idea of this talk isn't to say like, oh yeah, we can just do this, just do a whole bunch of complicated template stuff. The idea is, for now, the way we can experiment with it is to do this kind of complicated template stuff, get what we can and learn from that, and then use that to inform us of the language features later on. Uh, and the, the, the way I came to this conclusion is I, I looked back at, at things like uh, the Boost Lambda library, or even to some extent Boost Tuple and, and Boost Variant, without Without the Lambda library and without things like std tuple informing us for the need of variatics, I find it less likely that we would have gotten things like lambdas and uh, variatic templates in the standard. And uh, that's kind of how I think about all of my, my development when I do these kinds of strange libraries. I'm really just thinking about, OK, this is what we have to do now. People who want to experiment and figure things out now can do, can do that and, and learn from it. And hopefully, though, things will be better in the future. What we really want is just do what Python does. You know? we, want, you know, we, we just want that syntax without this magic template stuff behind the scenes. So what does Python do in this case, actually? So Python doesn't do anything in this case. This is, an extra, this is something even more powerful than that. But I mean, it, it, when I was talking about Python, I'm more talking about just simply like you know the tuple, the tuple things. That's an easy thing to solve. But um, the the Clay programming language is a better example because Clay actually does uh, it has an equivalent of the active alternative above. They it's called the dispatch operator, and so you just write if you have a variant and you're making a function call, you write an asterisk and then your variant, and it will do exactly what this does. It'll it'll expand out to all the possible uh, overloads, and it'll do it. And so, like, and it's a fully statically typed language. Not many languages do this. I, I don't know other languages that really have this facility. But following down that route, I don't see why C++ can't have that in the future. I don't see why it can't have any of these things. And, and I think 
when I look at languages like that or like Python that people maybe think of either as scripting languages or toy languages, I don't think of them as toy languages or toy language features. I think these are things that we should be really looking at and pulling into the language. And this is, this is the only way I know of, of experimenting with that. So, recapitulation. <laughs> uh, the ideas of this library provide simplified interaction with tuples and variants. Uh, reduces the amount of lambdas and utility functions that need to be created when you're interacting with your tuples and your variants. Uh, in general, at a high level, at the most top level uses, these are very easy to read and very easy to write. Obviously, once you get down into composition, you need to have a little bit more of an understanding. But at the high level, if you're just doing things like interacting with the active field of a variant or unpacking tuples, it's perfect. Uh, this detail I didn't go into, but one aspect of this library that is very powerful is it allows you to introspect branches, the branching behavior of your program. Uh, I think I deleted the slides for this. Yeah. So I deleted the slides for, for this, but I will briefly describe. So when you, when you use something like prov switch or you use something like prov if or even prov active alternative of, what you get back is something that you can use a type trait on to introspect all the possible overload paths and all the possible return values. And if you have this in mind, you can do things like implement state machine libraries in a way that instead of implementing it as a row, of a leading state, you know, your current state, an event, and a guard, and a transition, you can instead implement it as something like a state, a event, and a trans transition function that returns an argument provider of the next state that you're going to. And I wish that I didn't delete the slide for this because I think that might be a little bit tough to grok, like just verbally. But the general idea is you can write your state machine transitions and guards in an imperative fashion. And what you do is you do all of your branching in the form of argument providers. And then a state machine library can introspect all of the possible branches and deduce a graph for your state machine implicitly. So this is another project I was working on that I was hoping to finish by the time this talk came around. But I was unable to, but it's an interesting, uh, an interesting use. So state of the call library, like I said, this project's in research mode. High level details are, uh, are changing all the time and low level details. Uh, I'm working on some really, really detailed Boost QuickBook documentations that are all cross-linked and include examples of every single bit of the library uh, in terms of functionality. Like every single, every single function has an example implementation that's, that works and is tested against the, the, uh, the actual test suite. Uh, future possibilities, uh, I don't implement conditionally no except right now, but yeah. Implement automatic continuation chaining, I described this already. It wouldn't be able to work with call, as I alluded to, call kind of is the equivalent of chaining futures and then calling get, so it would have to be a different algorithm, but you can still use the same concepts behind the scenes. Um, I really want to inv investigate making this a language feature, as I said, some of my initial ideas are Eventually, if this actually proves fruitful and this proves useful, and I, and I discovered some patterns that I, that I would like to pursue, you can do this as something like an overloaded operator dot, dot, dot to do the expansion. And this would form kind of the equivalent of like an unpack, and you would just overload it for your types to do different things. Uh, that's just like a very vague idea. Um, there are other advantages of it being a language feature. Obviously, all the ones I said earlier, you, you don't have this complicated template mess, but it also would remove uh, it would actually make the, the, the library more performant because you don't have to be forwarding all these things around. It could be more optimizer friendly, make debugging simpler. This is the only, to me, the, the debugging is really the only problem I've encountered with this is if you screw something up and you jump to the debugger, you get these interesting stack traces. Uh, but the compile times are actually not really bad. But obviously, if it was a language feature, it would be good. The compile times are basically on par with just doing regular old um, std visits, std unpacks. It's, it's, it's the same order of the amount of, stan of template instantiations uh, if you were to do uh, something more manually with existing facilities. So it's actually, it's actually pretty cool. As long as you buy into the, the complicated mess behind the scenes enough to play around with it, 
it's reasonable. <laughs> and yeah, so you obviously wouldn't need so many scary advanced templates. So questions? Yeah. Is this, is it easy to do with recursive variants? How did I know you were going to ask something like this? <laughs> so Vittoria wants to know, uh, did, it, does this have I done anything to deal with recursive variants? I know I know of your like recursive variant visit stuff, and I, I haven't investigated that at all. But I mean, I don't see why. Like, if you were playing around the, with the library, that you could come up with something that that would work. So uh, one thing that comes to mind is if you have an array uh, mm -hmm. that has pseudo like access, a pseudo array, yep. so that immediately conforms to a pseudo like concept. Uh, is it something less. Well, it doesn't immediately. So all of the traits, yeah, you basically just have to write. And, and, and for implementing tuple-like, I think that the only thing that you need to specialize is what the index type is and the get. And oh, and you also need a, a tuple element. So you need three things. But it's, it's pretty quick to do. Well, because an array, it's reasonably intact. So it's yep. a requirement. Um, with with uh, tuple-like access um, for struct, because we had reflector, mm -hmm. um, that means you could just unpack a struct and call something on it, which is pretty cool. Yep, and you can do that. You can do that now without reflection. You just have to be manual about it. You would have to manually yeah. create. You'd have to manually create the thing, but with reflection, you could automatically create the specialization. Yeah, yeah. And then you'd be able to unpack your structs. You'd be able to access the struct by index with access tuple, yep. things like that. And that, and that specifically, I think, is really interesting because uh, there's there's one way you could think about dealing with user interfaces, which is just you know. Uh, a bunch of nested, you know, record types that involve, you know, you can imagine your menus as being nested things, and if you have reflection, you can implement automatic menu options and things. I don't know. You you can you can do all sorts of weird. Once once you have reflection and you have facilities like that, then you can do whatever. It's just a question: Do we do we get in the next standard something like destructive destructing operator, or do we uh, like like you put in a struct and you you. You throw this destructing operator at it, and you get a tuple of the type in the struct. Or do we always have to? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what exactly you're <laughs> you're yeah, asking. Because we, we can make this this uh, variable binding like, structure binding. Oh, the, okay, the structure binding. Maybe we have to this destructing destructing operator more or less implicit. So can we have it explicit? This the destructing operator explicit. We enabled it already. You're saying to interact with with structured bindings. I mean, we already have a way to to interact with structured bindings. If you uh, if you uh, if you if you hook into tuple ele std tuple element and std tuple size, and you can al already customize how the how the how that interacts with structured bindings. So that was one of the design decisions uh, early on. So so it it wouldn't you wouldn't need something like this. So. Uh, any other questions? I have more oh. silly ideas of how, like, uh, other things you could, um, like, adapt uh, as uh, make arguments for writer score, uh, which is a uh, bounded vector, like a dynamically sized um, container that has a, another bound on the compiler. Right. Like, a, yeah. So it has, like, a, a, an internal buffer storage, like, inline storage. Yeah. <laughs> and what was, what was the. Well, like, could you write an adapter? Or an argument provider for yeah. yeah, you can you so you can also write an argument provider for for any runtime container if you spe so in other words you're talking about like expanding yeah. around his arguments if you you can do it for std vector if you at compile time specify oh I know that this std vector is only ever going to be this size you can do that as well okay. yep so you could so if you really wanted to you can make a provider that takes a you know any container to any compliant range type actually that somebody gives you, and it will it will expand it out as separate arguments at uh, mm -hmm. compile time up to some fixed max. Mm -hmm. I don't have that implemented, but that would be very very trivial to to go ahead and implement if you wanted it. I mean that's what that's what languages like Python can do, right? But they don't have a limit. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Huh? I will upload it tonight. <laughs> so yeah, the story behind that is I, I got the code released and it was in an internal project and I've had I've been picking it apart. So 
I will, I will get it up as soon as possible.